Hi, welcome to America at its best. My name is Rebecca Painter and I'll be your host for today's show. Today, we're going to hear from Bob Williams Award winners. Some of you who have joined us at annual meeting in the past probably know that the Bob Williams Awards are the highlight of annual meeting. These awards are given to organizations who have been making an impact in their communities, in their states, and oftentimes throughout the entire country. We wanted to share some of the award winners and their stories with you today, just to give you a little taste of the impact that you are making possible all across the country. We have a lot of guests on today's show, so we'll be going through rapid fire. If you have any questions for any of our guests, please add it in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and we'll be sure to bring everybody back up on the screen at the end of the show and make sure we have time to ask your questions and get answers. So let's get started with Kathleen O'Hearn, who is a Senior Director of Policy at State Policy Network. Kathleen, welcome to the show. I'm so glad you're here. Now, Kathleen, you're here representing a group of folks who won the Network Award. So first tell us, what is the Network Award? Sure, so the Network Award celebrates when groups from this network come together to do something bigger than they could do on their own, bigger than just one state win, it's usually a win that truly transcends state borders and has national impact. Well, and that's what this is all about at State Policy Network. So this is one of the best awards. All right, tell us what organizations came together and, and won this award. Absolutely. So this year's Network Award, there's eight groups, and these groups were made up the healthcare working group for years, um, and that is the Buckeye Institute, uh, the Foundation for Government Accountability, the Goldwater Institute, the Mackinac Center, the Mississippi Center for Public Policy, Oklahoma Council for Public Affairs, the Show Me Institute, and the James Madison Institute. Okay, so all of these groups have been a part of, you mentioned a working group for a number of years. And as I understand it, they've been coming together, trying to make a difference in healthcare reform. And I've got to tell you, Kathleen, the folks I talk with, many people who are viewers to the show and just other folks all across the country, are often really discouraged by healthcare because it feels a lot like, well, the ACA passed or Obamacare, whatever you want to call it, and there's really nothing else we can do. So are you saying that's not true? Yes, I'm absolutely saying that's not true. Um, the working group actually started on the heels of the ACA getting passed on the notion that states can and should be a mechanism for change in healthcare. We have seen time and time again that states are the innovators here. And if we're looking to move away from this march towards nationalized healthcare, the way we're going to do it is the state, is showing the deregulation that happens at the state, how markets actually can work in healthcare, and just telling the story of how they're working. Because in a lot of instances, you know, when this all started, um, can you guys still hear me? My video froze. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Great. When this all started, um, I, you know, the pandemic was here, and I gave my, my two, my. Ah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. I gave my three-year-old ice cream for the first time. I was one of those no sugar moms, and. Sorry, a lot of tech issues here. Sorry about that. It happens. <laughs> it happens in this virtual world. There you are. Okay. So here I am. Hi. Here you um, are. So I, th I liken it very much to when this all started, the pandemic hit, I'm like, man, we're in a national pandemic. I'm finally going to give my two and a half year old at the time some ice cream. She'd never had it. It was like one of those no sugar moms. And the look on her face when she had had it, because I'd been giving her cottage cheese and telling her it was ice cream. Oh. It's just, <laughs> I know, I'm a bad mom. Um, <laughs> it was just elation, right? Like, so she's never going back to not knowing what ice cream tastes like. And I think for a lot of Americans who are using telemedicine, who are getting to experience having doctors from come across state lines, they're not going back, right? You're not putting the genie back in the bottle. So it's a really a demonstration of states leading the way. And this, the healthcare working group who got the award were really the instigators of creating those policy and creating a space for them. So you're saying this working group's been around a while, things were happening slowly, the pandemic hit, all of a sudden things happened a lot faster. So tell us how fast did things happen? And you mentioned a couple of the reforms that they made possible, but take us through kind of the whole 
kit and caboodle. Sure. So when it happened, the healthcare working group had been working on these policies for years. So they identified the five that would have the most impact. But the ones, the two I'm going to zero in on today um, are telemedicine and licensing. And a great demonstration of this is um, if you remember, there was this photo that went viral on Facebook. It was a bunch of doctors on a plane, on a Southwest airline plane, going from Georgia to New York City, which at the time was the, the height of the pandemic. And that was only possible because New York relaxed their licensing limits to let doctors from out of state come and practice medicine in the state. And though that picture was replicated all across the country when people did need to fly in and help these kind of hot zones. And the other one is telemedicine. I'm sure, Rebecca, you, um, people on this call have now, from the comfort of your home, sat and talked to your doctor. Maybe it took 10 minutes from the usual two hours it take from your schedule where you go and you sit in a dirty waiting room. I'm not saying- And get sneezed on, yeah. Yeah, and you get sneezed on, maybe or maybe not, it's COVID. Um, I don't think there's any putting the genie back in the bottle. And just to highlight how much happened, so more happened in 17 days in March than has happened in the last 10 years on healthcare reform. And when we summed this all up and looked at the work of this working group, 40 states took action to deregulate their healthcare system. And 24 of those were a direct result of think tank engagement. So, I mean, that is amazing. Yeah, I mean, we all talk about state solutions and national impact, and this is a great example of it. Now, look, this has all been amazing, but again, there's still a lot of work to be done in healthcare. There's a big cry for nationalized healthcare, and there's still a lot of work to be done. And part of some of these could still be permanent. So help us look ahead to figure out how you're going to build on this momentum yeah. in the fight for better healthcare. Absolutely. Um, so the network awards celebrate these pioneers in healthcare who came together and of course, they're not slowing down. They're saying, we got to keep going. We have to make these reforms permanent because that's really on all of us to say as a network, we now have to do the work to show that these reforms are not good just for times of emergencies, but, but good for every time. And I honestly think this is probably the biggest opportunity I've seen in healthcare since I started working on it like eight years ago. So we have a tremendous opportunity and we got it. We got it seize it. Okay, because Kathleen. We really do have a better way, right, to, to help make healthcare more affordable, better experiences, and just more accessible. So the work ahead is to remind people they've had a taste of the ice cream, they don't have to eat the cottage cheese anymore. Yeah, <laughs> is that so what you're can you say, right, now that we've tasted the ice cream, we're not going back to that old cottage cheese way. All right, good. Well, I know there's a lot more to unpack there, and we can get to more of that in the, in the Q&A portion of the show. Thank you, Kathleen. Next up is Phil Williams, the Director of Policy Strategy at Alabama Policy Institute. Alabama Policy Institute won the Bob Williams Award for most influential research. Phil, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me today. I appreciate it, Rebecca. Now, Phil, the Alabama COVID Task Force went to the Alabama Policy Institute for guidance. Tell us about the research that you shared with them. Yeah, we've had the honor uh, for the last uh, six months of being a member of the governor's task force. And, you know, I'll be honest with you, I like to say there's not been a lot of tasking for the force. Uh, <laughs> but the reality is, too, it gave us a chance to speak into certain issues. Uh, I, I previously served in the Alabama State Senate. And, and so our Senate pro tem, the leader of the state Senate, uh, Del Marsh, gave me a call one day and he said, Phil, we, we need some research for, from you. And it was on two issues. Uh, the issues were how are the shutdowns that we are seeing through the pandemic affecting civil liberties? And secondly, he said, I, I need you to take a hard look at our Alabama Department of Labor and tell me whether they are helping or hurting with regards to people being out of work and then going back to work. Oh, what great uh, questions. Okay. <laughs> if only everybody would ask those questions. I know, squared away. The, the guy, but see, here's the thing with um, Senator Marsh. He had everything at his disposal to do the research for him in the state house but he reached out to a third party conservative organization because he wanted the street cred of it coming from elsewhere. And, and we, we were the go-to. Um, that being said, in a matter of days, uh, we, the staff at API generated this report. Uh, we titled it Healthy Citizenry, Healthy Economy, Healthy Society. Okay. And, and we, we addressed all those issues. I met with Senator Marsh on a Thursday morning. I gave him the report and I showed him that our own Department of Labor was literally almost making it impossible 
for employers to get their employees to come back to work, they were truly incentivizing the ability to stay out, uh, even to the point of encouraging employers to fill out the forms. And, uh, wow. you know, we get unemployment compensation is necessary. It's there. It's real. It's for a reason. But it was to the point that we were not only through federal intervention paying people to stay out of work, but we were also at the point where we were uh, making it so easy in Alabama that no one wanted to go back to work. So Senator Marsh took our report. Uh, he drove straight to Montgomery, our capital. He, he gave it to the Secretary of the Department of Labor that same day. And 24 hours later, we had the, uh, you know, the, the joy of watching the Department of Labor change its policies and issue wow. new guidance that said, if you're called back to work, folks, you can't keep claiming benefits. If your employer calls you, you have to go back to work. So it was a huge day. Um, lots of great anecdotes in the middle of that that I'd be glad to share with you. But uh, it, it, was, it was great to see. You know, usually we see things move at what we call the speed of government, which means really slow. Uh, yes. In this particular case, you know, we got a report request. We generated the report within a matter of days. And 24 hours after its release, we saw the difference being made. Uh, how do you so, think people who live in Alabama, how are their lives different now because of your research and your fast action? Well, I can speak to it from the employer side. I know right off the bat that people were grateful because they, they automatically knew that someone had their back, that they literally were saying, we got to go back to work, y'all. We got to keep the business active and we're ready. We're, you know, no longer deemed non-essential by the government. We can work. And people didn't want to. I had one um, gentleman that owns a uh, HVAC repair service. He had 16 employees. They found out they could make more money on unemployment. They banded together and came to him and told him they wanted to shut the business down. And he said, uh, no, this is my life's work. <laughs> We're not going to do that. But that's the kind of thing that was happening. And, um, you know, we, we have seen uh, a turnaround. And you guys also did some research around emergency powers. Can you tell us a little bit about that? We did. Uh, um, one of the things that we also provided to the task force uh, was information related to the fact that we believe there needs to be some legislative checks and balances. Currently, we have one branch of government that's pretty much doing everything. Now, granted, we have a more conservative governor here than you might see in some other states. And, um, and she's been somewhat measured in her approach to this. But I will say this, it may not always be that way. And, and, and right now, we believe there's an absolute need for there to be uh, the representative branch of government having a chance to speak into these pandemic shutdowns in the future. Because um, right now, they don't. They don't have a voice. Uh, the, the governor's office makes all the decisions. And unelected state health officers are really driving that train. So yeah, we have some concerns and we've spoken to those directly. And that's not limited to Alabama. This is, uh, this is happening across almost all 50 states as I understand it. So thank you for your work in that area. Now, Phil, tell us before we let you go, uh, and we'll bring you back, of course, on Q&A, what's next uh, on, all, on all of this for Alabama and API? Well, thank you. We are, we are still working on issues related to civil liberties. And we're also having to forecast, you know, life as normal. I refuse to call this the new normal. This is abnormal. And then <laughs> we're going to get back to normal. Uh, and we'll all have an SPN conference in person again. But that being said, we're already projecting things forward on the next legislative regular session. And we're calling for a special session of our legislature to address some key issues that we think are short term necessary. Um, so yeah, it's a target rich environment. Um, but uh, as a conservative think tank, we, we definitely uh, have the work to do and we enjoy doing it. Well, you're definitely making an impact. Congrats on the award, Phil, and thank you. We'll, we'll see you again at the end of the show when we get into Q&A. Again, the Q&A box is at the bottom of the screen, so please type your questions there and we'll get the, to them in just a few minutes. Next up is John Hinderrocker, who is president of the Center for American Experiment. John won, John and, and the Center for American Experiment won the Best Issue Campaign Award. John, congrats on the award and welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Rebecca. So John, from what I understand, Minnesota has one of the most, or had one of the most oppressive shutdowns in the country. So how did your issue campaign get people safely back to work? Well, you know, the first thing that we did was we made a video that featured seven or eight small business people in Minnesota. And, you know, I actually shot part of that video. I went out to one of these places of business. It was closed down on a Saturday afternoon. I talked to the woman who owned it. And she explained to me how the shutdown had devastated, not just her, her business, but her life. It was very emotional. So it was personal to me uh, from the very beginning. 
So what we did was we set up a website uh, it was called backtoworkmn.com. The, the, the theme of the, of the campaign was Back to Work Minnesota. We put up billboards with that theme. We wrote op-eds, we did posts on our website. Largely though, it was social media driven, social media and digital ads. And what we wanted to do was drive people to that microsite back to work mn.com and they could watch the video there and they could read a fact sheet and they could very easily send emails to our governor tim walls and to their own senator and representative and well, what we now john we all know we all know that just a few emails from constituents can make a big difference so how many emails did you guys get yeah you're absolutely them? right rebecca the legislators pay attention to a few emails here they got fifty-two thousand. Uh, we got 52,000 emails sent to our governor and legislators, and we were hearing from legislators, my inbox is inundated with emails coming from backtoworkmn.com. So we put a lot of pressure on our public officials to relax the shutdown. Wow, 52,000 emails in a matter of days and, or weeks. How long did that go on? Yeah, it, it was several weeks. I think okay. about two, two or three weeks, probably. Wow, and so as a result, what's happened? Well, we haven't got a total relaxation or end to the shutdown, but we've got substantial relaxation so that churches that were originally being discriminated against are now allowed to reopen. Uh, restaurants are open again, although on a reduced basis. Gyms are open. Most businesses are operating now. That's really the, the key thing. And we got the golf courses open. That was kind of an uh, early victory. So, so we haven't had total success, but we've had substantial success. And John, what's next on the horizon for Minnesota? Well, we're going to keep working on this, Rebecca. I mean, um, you know, like most states, we've now got a mask mandate. Uh, we're still operating under all kinds of constraints. And I totally agree with Phil. I absolutely reject the idea that this is the new normal. This is abnormal. And we're going to get back to the real normal. And we're trying to make that happen. Well, and you took such a big step getting 52,000 people to help get things reopened. Before I let you go, John, you've got to tell me, why do you think your issue campaign was so effective? I think in part, Rebecca, because we did feature the, the video, which got hundreds of thousands of views of those small business people in Minnesota. That made it personal. Uh, their stories were really compelling. And I think that's one of the reasons why the campaign was successful. Okay, John, thank you. Thank you for your great work. And we'll see you again at the Q&A portion of the show in a few minutes. Next up my friend Carol Liebel, who's president of the Yankee Institute. Carol, welcome back to the show. So glad to have you. Oh, Carol, check your mute. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Hi, Rebecca, how are you? I'm doing great. Now, Carol, the Yankee Institute got the biggest home state win award for your package of economic reforms, which is huge because you live in a blue state. So <laughs> yes. tell, me, <laughs> tell me about a couple of the reforms that you guys past that led to this award? Sure. We were uh, so grateful and pleased uh, that SPN chose to acknowledge Yankee Institute in this way for our package of free market reforms, including a variety of economic relief and bureaucratic red tape cutting. Things like certificate of need for hospitals, where they had to ask permission for all kinds of routine things um, that no one should really have to ask the government to be able to do. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and to be able to uh, do more telehealth, uh, simple routine measures small businesses being able to uh, open up and, and get some relief, a variety of common sense things uh, for our, our businesses and our professionals and our tradespeople across Connecticut. So and, Carol, from what I understand, you talked about some common sense reforms. It's not like you guys just showed up at the state house one day and got a lot of stuff done. There wasn't even a COVID task force at the beginning that where businesses were represented. Tell us a little bit about the task force, your role in it, and how you came to have all these wins. Well, Governor Lamont, uh, Connecticut's governor, was a little bit late off the starting block in putting together any sort of reopening task force or advisory board. And other states were starting to think about opening back up. And Connecticut was staying very much closed. And so Yankee reached out and worked with him and his administration to talk about how are we going to start getting our people back to work. And then on the advisory board, there ended up being no small business representation. And of course, we love our small business people. 
big human, uh, big human resource department people have no idea how a little three person business is going to manage all these COVID regulations. And so we advocated strongly for putting people who would be able to represent that point of view on the, the task force. And of course they did. And then one of the things that we were so excited to be able to do was to introduce a beam of light feature. As you know, Rebecca, um, the famous English philosopher uh, and conservative Edmund Burke always talked about the little platoons of civil society. Mm -hmm. And Yankee Institute was very eager to make it clear that it wasn't just the government that was helping people during this crisis, that people were helping people and businesses were helping people. And one of our favorite of these, these beam of light, these people who were helping people in Connecticut was this little tiny Ridgefield pizzeria that itself was just struggling barely to stay in business. And it made this no one goes hungry pledge. And this little struggling pizzeria pledged that anyone who didn't have enough to eat should come in throughout the duration of the pandemic. And it made a guarantee that anyone who didn't have enough to eat could come to them and they would provide a free cheese pizzeria a free cheese pizza to anyone who needed one, as long as that person was in crisis. Wow, Carol, that's amazing. So Yankee passed economic reforms in a blue state, got positive stories of hope just like that out so that people realized it's not all doom and gloom. And you got on that task force and, and made some magic happen in terms of getting small business representation. Congratulations on the award. Tell us what's next for Yankee. Well, one of the things that we're really excited about uh, is, you know, as bad as the pandemic's been, we think there is some opportunity that it has opened in the field of, of letting people know um, it's time to really rethink educational opportunity for everyone with the micro schools and everything else. And we're really committed to, to making something good come of what has looked like an unfortunate situation. We can do it and we're committed to it. Good. I'm sure we're all going, going to want to hear a lot more about that in a future show. So thanks for, the, thanks for teasing us with a little snapshot. <laughs> and uh, we'll hear more about that and uh, definitely get back to you at Q&A in a few minutes. Thanks, Carol. You bet. Our next guest is Charles Mitchell. Charles is president and CEO of the Commonwealth Foundation in Pennsylvania. And the Commonwealth Foundation won the Bob Williams Award for biggest win for freedom. Charles, welcome back to the show. Hey, it's so great to be with you, Rebecca. Thank you. Now, biggest win for freedom. Tell me about the win. What did you guys do? You know, look, especially in a year when there's been so many attacks on freedom, it's so good to be able to celebrate a big win for freedom. And the best way I could explain this big win for freedom, Rebecca, would be to tell you about a couple of ladies in Pennsylvania named Erica and Amanda. Erica and Amanda want to live the American dream. They want to have salons. Okay, that's, what they're, that's their dream. There's only one problem. We have some really stupid, or sh I should say had, some really stupid anti-freedom laws in Pennsylvania, one of which uh, the Commonwealth Foundation got changed, said that you have to have good moral character to have a salon. Now, first question. Wait, who defines good moral character? Politicians. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I don't think there's a rule like that to serve in our legislature, which is one problem. But the second problem is that was interpreted to mean that even if you had had a slight criminal record and you had done your time and you had made amends and you had getting, got the help that you need and you had put your life back together and you were ready to go work and be independent and do what we all want for our fellow Americans, you can't do it. Well, that's crazy. That's dumb. That's not common sense. And so what, what uh, the Bob Williams Award recognized in Pennsylvania was over the last year, we got a whole package of bills passed to change stupid laws like that in Pennsylvania that don't make us safer. They just keep our fellow Americans, our fellow Pennsylvanians from living the American dream and they cost us a lot of money and they make us less safe. That's what we've been up to. And, and people are getting back to work. So this reform, tell me how it helps the average person who might be concerned about public safety and their own safety because there's been a lot of um, there's been a lot of debate around different kinds of criminal justice reforms and this one yeah seems a little bit different in, in that regard. Yeah, no, look, it's a great question. And I'll tell you straight up, I want everybody to be safe, especially my four daughters. So nobody's a bigger believer in public safety than I am. And that's why reforms like this matter. 
we have lots of criminal justice policies in America, and, in there, and those are really done at the state level primarily, that make us less safe. They put people in state prison, especially, for longer than they need to be or when they don't need to be there. And a perfect example here in Pennsylvania is before some of these reforms that we got done, we were keeping people in state prison, which by the way, the state pen costs more than Penn State. You know, it's like $40,000 a year to keep people in the state pen. It's more than tuition at Penn State. That's a problem, right? Now, look, if somebody needs to be in state prison and they're a hard criminal and everything, they should be there because I don't want them anywhere near my daughters. But for example, if their term has run out and we just are so incompetent at getting them released that they're in there for extra days, weeks, or months at a time, that costs a lot of money and it doesn't make us any safer. That's the kind of thing that's been going on in Pennsylvania. And that's why I feel so strongly about this. Yes, I want everyone to be safe. We are safer when we do common sense criminal justice reforms like what we've gotten done in Pennsylvania in the last year and also in the last 10 years. And of course, the size and cost of government shrinks. That's a double win for our movement, I think. I think I think so. So Charles, you talked, I, I love it. The pen costs more than Penn State. Do you do you know the impact of this in terms of people and money saved? We do. Um, there are 3 million Pennsylvanians like Erica and Amanda who now have the opportunity to live the American dream because of some of these laws um, that we got passed. And, and some of the other ones that we got done that address like the other situations I talked about where people should be getting out and they're just in there for no good reason. Um, those benefited 300,000 other Pennsylvanians. And this, for us, Rebecca, this isn't a one-time thing. I mean, we, we are thankful for the reward, but it's just part of the overall tapestry of the work that we do in Pennsylvania. And we've seen over the last 10 years, because of a bunch of reforms like this that we've gotten passed, we've actually seen our, it's our number three expenditure in state government. We've seen, we've bent the curve um, on, on what was really a skyrocketing cost of government. And again, like, we want to be safe, right? So if we really needed all these people in prison, I'm going to be first in line to put them in prison and to put them in prison for a long time. Um, but if we can actually be safer and save money, we should do it. Um, and that's what we've done over the last 10 years and including over the last year uh, in Pennsylvania. Well, Charles, you say in the last year, but I imagine this fight took quite a while. So take us through how long this fight lasted and you know, is this, was this just one political party that made it happen? Like what are the politics involved? Tell us the story. Yeah, well, the, the, the greatest thing I think at this, at the, especially at this time in American history about these wins in Pennsylvania is they are emphatically bipartisan. In fact, some of the bills that we got passed, especially more than a few, uh, more than a year ago, we got done unanimously. Um, wow. but all the recent package, they were bipartisan. And at a time when, as you, as you said, there's a lot of heat around some of these issues. And there are some ideas that are out there that pose, I would say, as criminal justice reform and aren't criminal justice reform. They're not reform, they're, they're terrible ideas. Uh, but there's, there's so much heat about this. I'm really thankful and I'm really proud um, that thanks to this network, thanks to our supporters, we have been able to find smart solutions that have brought, yes, both parties together and that have made us move forward on some of these contentious issues. I, look, I don't, I don't, look, I work hard. You know me, Rebecca, you know that. Like I work hard and I don't work hard just to yell at people just to you know, be able to say, I fight for freedom. Like, I want to get stuff done. And where we can actually have people who, yeah, don't agree about everything, come together and find solutions to problems that really improve people's lives. Uh, I think that's a great thing. And, and by the way, you know, we've been able to do that on, on education, which I think is the other side of this whole issue, right? Who are the most of the people in our prisons? They're people that our schools have failed. Um, and that was actually a Bob Williams Award last year that, um, that Commonwealth won. So I love that we be able to bring both parties together and we're able to work on both sides of, of this issue and, and help people and serve people and allow them to live the American dream. Thanks, Charles. I think uh, that's a, a great point. And, and one thing that it's shared by everyone who won an award is the ability to bring people together, whether it's people who come from different political spectrums or just different walks of life at a time when this country is so divided this yeah. network has really found ways to bring people together. To and we do it by building relationships and bringing people together around solutions. And also, Rebecca, I have to say something else. I voted for all the other winners. So I really <laughs> feel good on this broadcast. I was thinking about that while they were talking. I think I ran the circuit. I got them all right. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's good to know. We should make sure, <laughs> make sure we track that better next year so we can let folks know. <laughs> all right, Charles, thank you. We'll, we'll stay up here because we're about to get into the Q&A portion of our show. If you have a question, please. 
stick it right in the Q&A box at the bottom. Uh, our first question is a, is a great one. So I just want to get us started with it. And I'd really like to go around uh, and I'll just call you guys out by name. And Carol, I'm actually going to start with you because you're first on my screen. You talked a little bit about you know, what's next in terms of this reform, but this question, these, these words all came because you guys are making such a gigantic impact. So Carol, as you think about the state of Connecticut, where do you see in the next few months Yankee being able to make another really big impact? Well, we all always think of our work uh, in two different buckets. First of all, we are going to remain incredibly committed to defending the people of our state against the encroachments of a legislature that is always inclined to tax too much and uh, encroach too much on their freedoms. And so um, we will remain on guard against continuing efforts to toll uh, it, continuing efforts by the state to try and uh, come in and take over municipal responsibilities like zoning and mm -hmm. do things like that. Uh, so that it will remain in our sort of defensive bucket. We will also continue to, to push forward on the frontiers of freedom uh, in our worker freedom initiatives and also, again, in the area of education because we do see a new consensus forming among everyone from suburban moms to moms in the cities. Our children need alternatives. Thanks, Carol. Phil, where do you see an opportunity for API to make another big impact or get another big win between now and the end of the year? Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. So um, we have the benefit in, in Alabama of living in one of the more conservative states in the nation. Um, the, the interesting piece of that is uh, then, then you have to look and see who claims to be a conservative and who's not. Uh, so, you know, we, we've, we've got some- you know, you're talking to a girl from South Carolina, so I, I hear you. <laughs> I can, you can relate. So, uh, yeah, so the reality is uh, we, we are doing some things right now to make sure that we are messaging out uh, the votes, the attendance, and the capabilities and, and work being done uh, by legislators uh, to their broader constituencies, because too often, and I can speak from experience since I served in the legislature uh, that e e people don't tune in or even know what is actually happening and they, they don't recognize uh, what they overlooked. Um, the other piece of that is we are really pushing hard right now for the governor to engage the legislature in a special session. They can't just come back on their own. They, they literally have to have a call from the governor and right now she's apparently content just to do it all on her own. Uh, we believe that the representative body needs to get engaged in this and there's some issues, for instance, Alabama has one of the only tax codes in the nation that could potentially allow the State Department of Revenue to tax everybody on their federal relief dollars as a windfall. Uh, and that's just, that's just wrong. So the government shuts you down, and the government provides you relief, and then the government gets to tax you on the relief. And so that can't happen. And, and that needs to be determined by the end of this year so that as people begin drafting their tax documents for the you know, upcoming season, they know where they stand and their legislature has to get involved and fix that for them. Okay, thanks. Charles, what do you, you know, see as the biggest opportunity? I, I love hearing from my friend, Phil. You know, he, your, your governor won't call the legislature back to session. Our governor of Pennsylvania won't even talk to the legislature. Like, can't, we can't even, can't even get on the phone. Like, it's crazy. But that's why we in our movement have to keep fighting, right? And here in Pennsylvania, I'll just give you one of, of many things that's, that's popping right now, Rebecca, even though these people won't talk to each other. Um, Pennsylvania still has to figure out how they're gonna spend the federal money that came out earlier this year with the CARES Act. And going off of what Carol said earlier, we have put forward the idea that some of that money should be placed in an account for families to be able to use to get their kids back on track. We call it back on track education accounts. And you've seen this idea of, um, in other places across the country as well. Well, it's coming to be time in the next couple of months for Pennsylvania to finally make decisions as to how they're gonna spend the other billion dollars that we have sitting around from the feds. It has to be used to recover from COVID-19. It would be such a game-changing thing to have some of that money used to give these families that opportunity. Yeah, wow. All right, Kathleen, you already mentioned making it permanent and fighting nationalized healthcare. Anything you wanna add in terms of what this working group will work towards as big wins in the short term? Yeah, I mean, I think the big message here is we are seeing massive disruption in these big systems that have been around for a long time that have been hard to 
make a difference. And we all got into this to make a difference. And, and now is our chance. So we cannot lose this opportunity to, to chart that better course forward in healthcare and education. Um, but in healthcare is probably the biggest opportunity we'll have in a long time. So let's, 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 let's chart a course. Yeah. Thanks, Kathleen. Okay, next question, Kathleen, I'm going to punt this one over to you, at least to get us started. We heard a little bit from Phil about this um, lack of, a, of, of check and balances in terms of executive action, which in healthcare, you know, actually ended up in our favor, but generally speaking, was not a good situation across the country. There are a lot of groups who are working on this. The question is, what do we see here as actual movement to change things? I kind of, can you give us a lay of the land in terms of what's really happening here and what is possible and how deep is the problem really? On government overreach? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. The executive power piece, yeah. Yeah, executive power. I mean, in healthcare, the executive power honestly operated as it should. It said like, we are fighting a healthcare crisis. That's the nature of this crisis. So we need to expand our healthcare system to meet that demand, right? But you did see a lot of instances of overreach. And for the most part, a lot of states and fellow panelists here will have a lot to offer on this too. A lot of states have states emergencies for a hurricane, for something that's very short term. And this has been like not months and months and months. So what you're seeing is now states putting better procedures in place around emergency management, like what happened in Kansas to say, okay, governor, you can't carte blanche just you know, rule from the diocese, you have to have a legislative committee approve it. And we're seeing things like that across the country because we have to start thinking about what's that right balance. In some instances, their governors do need to have that authority to take quick action, but a lot of times they're just overreaching and the result is hurting a lot of lives and livelihoods. And we have to find a better path around that. Do you guys think there'll be some change in that sooner rather than later um, to kind of stop some of these shutdowns that are still going on? I'll be glad to take that for a second. Yeah, so the reality is, um, I mean, Governor DeSantis down in Florida, one of our neighboring states recently announced that as long as he's ever governor, there will not be another shutdown for any reason. Um, and, and I applaud that. The, you know, we've seen one of the things that's gonna have to change in Alabama, who knew that an unelected state health officer had so much authority? And, and, yeah. and you know, one of the things that nobody even realized in Alabama was at some point in the past, the legislature had passed what we call a local bill and had given Jefferson County, our largest county in the state, its own health officer who even superseded his authority at the state level. So uh, our attorney general has had to admonish uh, mayors on more than one occasion for overreach. And then we have issues like our uh, ABC board, which is um, Alabama's Alcohol Beverage and Control Board, they literally decided recently that if you own a liquor license, you have to shut down and stop selling alcohol at 11 o'clock at night. I guess it's safer at 10.59, but at 11, coronavirus hits hard, apparently. So, I mean, it's an arbitrary thing by an unelected body. And so I think one of the things we're going to have to see a change in is um, bureaucrats making decisions that shut down everybody, and yet they keep their government paycheck going without any issues, and private sector suffers. And... Uh, and that, that's been one of the most remarkable things in Connecticut. Uh, this, this spring, uh, we pointed out that even as through executive order, Governor Lamont shut down, and we're a small state, of course, but 36,000 private businesses and threw a half million people out of work, our government employees received their second 5.5% pay increase for the second year in a row. And he refused to suspend it or delay it or do anything of the sort. And that wasn't lost on the people of our state. We've gotten to the point where our governor is more moderate than our, legislate, our legislature, uh, but he um, persists in extending his emergency powers, even though our situation continues to improve. And he's actually surpassed uh, the, the, the part where he is supposed to have uh, continued to open the state and he doesn't. So we've led the uh, charge in asking, uh, please, we need metrics, epidemiological metrics, not just temporal. We're going to do this for another six months. Yeah. Yeah. You Charles, know, anything let, to add? Yeah. Let me give you guys just one other little example of why everything you said is true. Uh, 
here in Pennsylvania, Commonwealth Foundation is working with a woman named April. April was diagnosed with really serious breast cancer a few months ago. Uh, before COVID, she was told she was okay, that she was cancer free. Then she didn't get as much medical attention as we would hope because of the quarantine. And you probably know where I'm going with this. Her cancer has come back and it's come back with a vengeance. Well, guess what she tried to do next? What any reasonable person would do, especially in this geographic area, get a second opinion from Sloan Kettering. Probably the same thing somebody in Connecticut would do, you know, Sloan Kettering being in New York between us and Connecticut. Or, and uh, guess what? Well, even though our governor issued an executive order, like you talked about earlier, Kathleen, um, that made telemedicine okay during the emergency, he also vetoed a bill to make it permanent, which confused all the lawyers. So Sloan Kettering told April she couldn't get a second opinion from them. You want to talk about hurt, hurting people's lives, hurting people's livelihoods? I mean, that's what this is about, guys. And you guys know that. But this is what our politicians have to understand. Now, of course, we've gone to bat for, for April. She got her second opinion from Sloan Ketter, and we had to get a special dispensation from the governor and a whole host of other baloney. But the point isn't just April. And she would say that if she were here. She would say, we have to fight. Our network, our movement have to fight for all the other people who, because of these executive decisions and because of all this authority that these governors have taken unto themselves, and I'll be the first day, governors in both parties. Phil's governor's Republican. Yes. My, you know, mine's a Democrat. Carol's, I mean, I'm still getting used to the phrase, Governor Ned Lamont. We can talk about that later. <laughs> um, but it's a problem in both parties. It's a problem in all kinds of states. And it's not just some academic thing of like, oh, you know, uh, executive authority. It hurts people like April. And we have come a long way, I think, in pushing back on this nonsense over the last few months. We got a lot left to do, and I know our movement's going to get it done. Charles, thank you for saying that, because as we were talking, I thought, gosh, I'm really geeking out on, the, on all this executive power stuff, because I find it so fascinating. But I think one thing that this network has really done in the last few years is, is realize that it's more about just us geeking out about policy and internal weird wonky stuff, but realizing that these are real people uh, and, and putting faces on that and getting those messages out, which is why I think we're having so much, so many more wins right now. So thank you guys so much. Thanks for joining today. Congratulations on your awards. Viewers, thank you because you're the ones who made all of this impact possible. And we're so glad that you were able to tune in and, and see a little bit about of what you're making possible around the country. So I hope you guys are able to mark your calendars for October 14th. That's October 14th at one o'clock. We're going to have a special show. Tracy Sharp will join us. She just met with Vice President Pence last week. So she's going to tell us a little bit about the meeting. And we're also going to get an update about how your partnership is driving economic recovery. So you'll hear more about that. And I uh, hope you can join us. Thanks so much for tuning in. Appreciate all you do. Have a great rest of your week.